working? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So tell me if I'm talking too loud or too loud because I cannot hear myself with the microphone. Um, so uh, as I was saying, thank you, Sean, for the invitation. Um, even though it only says my name in here and what I'm going to present, uh, different parts, there are several people involved, and I will try to give proper credit, but that part appears. Um, so let me start. If I have to summarize um, this talk in one single line, I would say that continuous and only continuous finite element can be used for geometric problems. This line by itself is extremely broad, so it means actually nothing. So uh, my goal in this talk is to clarify what I mean by each piece, what I mean by um, finite element method, what I mean by a geometric problem, and what I mean by can be used. So uh, let's start with a geometric problem. What, what I understand for a geometric problem it's uh, given some initial surface, a geometric problem would be something that tells you the normal velocity in terms of geometric quantities. Geometric quantities such as the normal, the curvature, or um, something else. And some typical examples of geometric problems are mean curvature flow, where the normal velocity is um, given by the mean curvature. Kappa is the mean curvature, or minus the mean curvature to be a specific. Surface diffusion, where the normal velocity is the surface gradient of the mean curvature. And something a little more interesting and complicated, a geometric model for a biomembrane, where the normal velocity now is given by this force order operator, as uh, it was for surface diffusion. Force order because curvature is a second order operator of the position, so now we take Laplace of the curvature. And also this interesting combination, nonlinear combination of Gaussian and, uh, Gaussian and mean curvature here. Once you have a finite element method to deal with these geometric problems, it's not so hard to extend it to um, a, a fluid structure interaction where your structure is modeled by a geometric problem. And examples of these are capillarity, that would be the model that you use for a free dot droplet of water in vacuum in the absence of gravity, let's say, um, or a model for a fluid biomembrane where you couple uh, biomembrane with some fluid inside and outside. And once you have um, a finite element method that can solve problems on a surface, problems on a bulk, it's not so hard to extend the method to do um, optimal shape design type of problems. For example, the design <coughs> of the shape of a bypass that minimizes uh, some energy, uh, the design of an object that minimizes uh, the drag. So uh, before I proceed further, let me show you just simulations without saying much, just for the uh, entertain of the eyes. So this uh, would be a geometric model for a biomembrane. This is the initial shape of a biomembrane and uh, axis a non-axisymmetric toroidal shape. Oops. And this is how it evolves under the geometric model. So again, I, I will not tell you more details now. It's just to entertain your eyes, things that you can do with this method. And this would be uh, a fluid a structure interaction for the biomembrane. So now there is a, a membrane and some fluid inside. Now you can see the effects of the fluid. I don't know if you can see the color is not good for the projector but there is kind of like a wave expanding from outside inward due to the fluid. Um, so, what, uh, how, how will the talk go on? So introduction is what I, I have just done. So what I want to do is to talk about a common framework in which all these applications can be put. And that common framework involves doing some calculus on the surface. Then um, most of this geometric problem come by differentiating some geometric energy with respect to the shape, that's uh, the, the shape calculus, and then what kind of final element method I am using to tackle this problem, and I call it the geometric final element method. And after this common framework, I'll show you a couple of applications, actually three applications. Uh, one will be biomembranes, one will be shape optimization, and the other one will be surface restoration. This looks out of place because this is uh, a, re a recent addition that I have been working on, so this is like a, a new topic, and um, this part here is kind of like a, 
an, an older topic. So, um, calculus on a surface. Well, um, this is one way to do calculus on a surface. Assume that you have a smooth surface, then you can define around this surface an epsilon neighborhood where the distance function will be well defined. And tangential derivatives can be defined on the surface using um, some extension coming from the distance function. And for example, you can define the surface gradient of a function v defined on a surface through the classical Euclidean gradient of the extension. So this is the classical Euclidean gradient of the extension. And this is a projection onto the surface. And that's how you define the tangential gradient. Similarly, you can define the tangential of the surface divergence and the tangential or the surface Laplacian that is known as the Laplace Beltrami operator. Of course, there is a whole theory behind this. And this, this extension, it's well defined, gives you the right definition. And it's the same definition that you get if you were using local charts and classical differential geometry. And it can be equipped with uh, many different tools to do calculus. The first one is integration by parts. You can do integration by parts on surfaces. This is very important if you want to do final element method. You want to find a weak formulation for your problem. And even though it looks a little bit uh, different, it's quite similar to the integration by parts that you see in Euclidean space. For example, Im imagine that f e equals 1. Then this term is not going to be there. This term will be just a divergence. And what this equation is telling you is the integral of the divergence over gamma is how much f is going out of gamma. So it can go out of gamma if gamma has a boundary. But it can also go out of gamma through the normal direction now. So that's why you get two terms. And also, you get a bunch of product formulas that they still look similar to the product formulas that you have in Euclidean space. <coughs> Excuse me. But the, the, the new part of formula that you get are geometric identities. That if you read these um, on the plane, they are quite trivial. So for example, one that I, I want to emphasize in particular is this formula here. It says, if you take the surface Laplacian of the identity, you get the curvature times the normal. Or for example here, if you take the divergence of the normal, you get the mean curvature. So this equation here in the plane, they look quite, quite trivial. This is saying the Laplacian of the identity is 0. right? But for surfaces, they become interesting and useful. Um, so most of this uh, geometric problem, they come up at some uh, minimization of um, a functional that depends on the geometry. So uh, let me talk a little bit about um, shape optimization problems and the shape derivative. My goal is to introduce uh, the shape derivative. So uh, in a shape optimization problem, you have a functional that depends on the shape. A shape for me will be a domain, let's say a domain in RD. And in particular, I would like to focus on functionals that can depend directly on the shape, but implicitly on the shape through a solution to a partial differential equation that depends on the shape. And the minimization problem is then to find an admissible domain or shape, omega star, that minimizes the shape functional. So uh, to, to, to make this uh, a little more concrete, let's talk about a classical example. So consider a channel where you are solving a steady stoke flow. So the flow is described at the momentum equation and the incompressibility condition. And let's say we impose um, a velocity profile in the inflow, some traction free profile for the some traction free for the outflow, and some no slip condition on the lower upper wall and on the boundary of the object. So this could be the inflow profile. And what we want to uh, take into account is the drag functional. And the drag functional is defined at, as the force that the fluid exerts on the boundary on the horizontal direction. So this is the horizontal direction. This is uh, the force the fluid exerts on the object, or the, the opposite force. And this is the shape functional. So observe that the shape functional not only depends directly on the shape, because the shape determines the shape of the object, but also indirectly on the shape through the solution to this partial differential equation that, in turn, 
depends on the shape. So that's the kind of shape functional that I am talking about. And to make sense of the optimization problem, you would look for the shape that minimizes this functional, and uh, a, a reasonable restriction to impose is that you look among all the shapes with the same volume. You don't want this to collapse to a point. Um, so whenever you're doing optimization problems, something very useful is the derivative, and this is no exception. We have some function that depends on the shape, and what we want to find is something that is the shape derivative. So this notation here means uh, the shape derivative of the functional j evaluated at the point or shape omega in the direction of a field v. So one way to define this is through what is known as the velocity method. So given a, a smooth vector field v, the direction field, the velocity method will generate some perturbation or some fictitious motion of your domain solving uh, an autonomous system of ODEs. So you solve that system that gives you a perturbation of your domain and then you can um, define a family of perturbed shape through that deformation that you computed before. And now when, once, once you have this deformation induced by the direction field V, you define the shape derivative as the limit of the functional and the perturbed domain minus the functional at the domain itself divided by the time and take the limit. And again, there is a whole theory here that says this is well defined and this is how you define the shape the derivative. The most important thing, or a very important thing about the shape derivative is known as the hadamard solisio theorem. And it basically says that uh, the shape derivative is given by a scalar function that is only defined on the boundary. So this is uh, telling two things. The first thing is that all the shape derivative is concentrated on the boundary. Even in principle, it depends on something that is happening on inside. Actually, it can be uh, determined by what happens on the boundary. And it only takes into account the normal component. That's why it's a scalar. So you put a vector field in w that will tell you how to perturb your shape. But the shape derivative only sees the normal component of that vector. So one scalar function living on the boundary, that's the shape derivative for this type of functionals. So um, before getting more into results, just one quick example, or a couple of quick examples. The simplest shape functional would be the volume. You're integrating one over the domain. In that case, you do the computation, and it's not too hard to see that the shape derivative is given by the divergence of the uh, direction field. You use the divergence theorem, and you can write that integral as a boundary integral. And that's how you get that 1 is the shape derivative for the volume functional. If you would put some, uh, oops. If you would put some density there, then that density is the shape derivative. And now um, you can also consider the area functional as a shape functional, because even though we only see the boundary of the domain, the boundary is a function of omega itself, so it qualifies. And in this case, it's uh, a little more difficult to see, but eventually you can see that the shape derivative of the area is the mean curvature. And if you put some density function, then there is also some new terms appearing, like this one here. That was not before. Um, still, we are uh, a step away from the original problem. So in the, in the original problem, we not only want to put a phi that depends on x, but also that depends on omega. So something that can be shown is that the chain rule works for the shape derivative. So you can fix the domain and take the shape derivative inside the integrand, and fix the integrand and take the shape derivative with respect to the domain, which is what I did in the previous case. So this is what I get using the previous case. And now I have to tell you how to compute the shape derivative of the solution to a partial differential equation. And that comes in the flavor of solving another partial differential equation. So you have this differential equation that is the u that you want to put in here. So the phi prime that would be the u prime, the shape derivative, is the solution to another differential equation, which is called the dual, uh, the dual problem. And the, the original problem would be the primal problem. So that's how you compute shape derivatives. 
So in the case of uh, the drag that I talked about before, what you get at the end for the shape derivative is this scalar function here. So here we recognize the u as the velocity of the of the problem, and you see that there is a new name z. Well, z is the solution of the dual problem, but this is the shape derivative in any case. So that's kind of like one with example how um, what I said before in the abstract setting end up working. Uh, so now uh, we talk about um, calculus on a surface, how to find shape derivatives. Now let's see how to use, uh, uh, how to discretize this type of problem with the final element method. And the best way to introduce the final element method is with the simplest possible example that you can come up in the context. In this case, I will consider this geometric energy, the area that uh, I talked before, and the velocity, the normal velocity, is given by the shape deri mi minus the shape derivative of this function here. So this flow, the mean curvature flow, what creates is a flow that tries to minimize the area. Because I am moving the surface in the direction of minus the shape derivative of the area. So this is what you get as a scalar equation, normal velocity minus the mean curvature. We can convert this to a vector equation if we multiply by the normal. I'm not doing mass anything there. Then this is just a definition. The mean curvature times the normal is the vector mean curvature. And if you remember the formulas that I introduced at the beginning, we have this geometric identity that the vector curvature is the Laplacian of the identity. Now the velocity is the time derivative of the identity. So we can write this equation for mean curvature flow. Now I have only one unknown, or one vector unknown, which is the position. And we can integrate by parts here. So I multiply by a test function phi, I integrate by parts, and I get the weak formulation of that equation there for the mean curvature flow. Now something to notice here is that the normal disappear from the equation. So I have position without really having to specify the normal. So that's an advantage if we want to use only continuous low-order finite elements, because we will not have access to the normal at the nodes. So how does uh, the method work? Well, first you discretize the domain with the triangulation. So we use the triangulated surface of the original surface, the original continuous surface. And then we discretize uh, with a semi-implicit Euler scheme in time, so that means that the time derivative is replaced with this incremental quotient. And the semi part comes because all the domains of integration are done in the previous domain, and all surface operators are computed with respect to the previous domain. So this is something that you can implement at the discrete level. And that will generate a sequence of <coughs> triangulated meshes. So how do you generate the next mesh? Well, you have gamma n, you know xn plus 1, so you replace each node in gamma n by what xn plus 1 tells you, and you keep the same connectivity. And that, that, that will be on the, the simplest problem um, in which the method uh, uh, I want to describe, uh, how it applies, the method I want to describe. So first application is uh, uh, for, for a biomembrane problem. So in the, in the previous slide, you, see a shape, you saw a shape functional that all it has was the one here and nothing else. In this case, the shape functional has uh, the mean curvature square, and these two other terms are to impose an area and a volume constraint. So we look for an energy um, that's called the bending energy that tries to find a shape that minimizes the square of the mean curvature subject to an area and a volume constraint. So that's the energy, London P and Lagrange multiplier. And so we're proceeding basically the same way. First, we want to compute the shape derivative. So we have all these tools. We have um, uh, what, I, what, what I was going to say. We have formulas to compute shape derivatives of different quantities, and in particular of uh, geometric quantities like the normal uh, and the curvature. And so doing this, uh, let's say, um, automatic process, well, you have to do computation, but you know what, 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 what to do with the terms. So eventually, you end up finding that the shape derivative of this functional j, that uh, for some reason I call w here, I, I know the reason, but 
it, it's the same J as before. Uh, oh no, no, that that's why it's called W because it's missing these two terms. So if I don't put these two terms, the the J would be called W. So the the shape derivative of the first term is given by this expression here. And now we want to discretize this, let's say, with final elements. That's uh, not very nice, in particular because we had to compute the gradient of the normal. That's a good quantity that we don't have available. But again, we can use uh, integration by parts, uh, product, um, formulas, geometric identities, and rework this expression. And after a lot of work, we can rewrite this exactly in this way. So this and this are exactly the same. But the second way of rewriting it is a lot more friendly to implement the finite element scheme. So thi for this, we will use uh, a mixed method because uh, basically we have a fourth order problem that we can discretize with a system of second order problems. The unknowns will be the position x and the curvature h. Having h as an unknown is good because h has a variational form. That was basically the mean curvature flow that I presented before. So then you can create a final element scheme. And without giving any more details, just let me show you one other simulation with the biomembrane. So we have a, bi a finite element scheme for the geometric problem. Then it's not so hard to couple this with, let's say, Navier-Stokes equation with the fluid inside. And this is a coupling of the geometry with uh, a fluid for a biomembrane model. And this is how it looks like. So this bended banana goes to a peanut shape and it oscillates due to the inertia of the fluid. OK, and of course, if you have a, a three-dimensional fluid, you have a lot of information available there, and you can only see a little bit. So this is a, an, another way to see the information. You can see what the flow is doing inside the, the, the banana shape, how it's flowing. So this should be three-dimensional streamlines. If you can see, they're like on top of the other one. Um, OK, uh, now, second, that was the first application. You can use this type of final element for a uh, couple fluid structure problems, like the biomembrane. And this would be in, uh, for, for the shape optimization. So I even though uh, our work here, oh, um, there were some names before that appear, but I didn't mention. So people involved um, in this project of the biomembrane were a Andrea Bonito, that is currently in Texas A&M, and Ricardo Nocheto at the University of Maryland. And now uh, this is some um, shape optimization part. Uh, our work in here was to develop some uh, adaptive scheme for doing working with shape optimization problem. But I will not talk about the adaptivity, just of the main step of the algorithm without adaptivity and how the final element method that I talk about can be used here. And the, the people involved here were um, Pedro Morin, Ricardo Nacheto, and Marco Verani. So the, the idea is to um, create a sequence of domains that are evolving in a way that are uh, minimizing your shape functional j. So I, I will skip this and go to the algorithm itself. So uh, the, the setting for the algorithm. First, uh, you need to define some Hilbert space on the surface, on the boundary. And the scalar product is given by bk. And then what you do is uh, you replace, you, you're, you're at the point of your functional, which is a surface. And you replace your functional at this point by some quadratic model. So imagine that you have a weird function. You pick a point, and you replace it with a paraboloid at that point. And you want to work with the paraboloid, because we know how to find the minimum of a paraboloid, but we don't know how to find a minimum of our problem. So uh, well, what we do is if we consider this uh, quadratic model at that point, omega k, where it's kind of like a, a Taylor expansion, with the difference that in the Taylor expansion, you could put the second derivatives here. But the second derivatives, in this case, can be difficult to compute and not positive definite. So we put some bilinear functions that is uh, pleasant to us. And in this case, I put the scalar product that I selected on, on the surface. So um, the shape derivative can be represented by this risk representation, the scalar function that I talked about before. And now it's, it's easy to show that 
uh, the minimizer of the quadratic problem is given by solving an elliptic equation here. And that minimizer could be a descent direction for our problem. And once we have a descent direction, the next step is to pick a time step. Uh, to pick a time step. Maybe that is coming in the next slide. Sorry about that. So this is a, a search direction. And it's easy to prove that it is a descent direction, meaning that if you move in that direction, the shape, uh, the shape derivative is positive, so minus the shape derivative is negative. And once you have a descent direction, what you want to do is to find a step size to advance in that uh, descent direction. So these are all the steps of uh, the exact algorithm. So you solve some partial differential equation, let's say the the, the drag minimization you solve for the velocity and the pressure, then you want to compute um, the shape derivative. Computing the shape derivative will involve solving another partial differential equation. And then to compute the descent direction, you solve an, ellip an elliptic problem on the surface. And once you have a descent direction, you have to find um, an admissible step size, and you use that descent direction with the step size to update the mesh. So, of course, uh, this is uh, not realistic because you cannot solve exactly most of the things that are here. So everything that is in red here has to be approximated. And the approximation is done using some final element method. So let's say for, for A and B, you use a final element method for the fluid. And for C, you have to use a final element method on the surface. So the, the, the whole goal of this, and I, I will go uh, a little fast over this, was to um, identify the two problems, the PDE problem, the geometric problem, each one involves some error, and to link and balance these errors in the tolerances so that you don't, the, the philosophy could be that you don't solve one of the problem with, uh, with a little error if you are making a lot of error in the other problem. That wouldn't make sense. So this is uh, the philosophy. And we also wanted that at the beginning, when you're far from the minimizer, be as coarse as possible, but as you're getting closer to the minimizer, be finer and finer. And so here is uh, just one illustration, and uh, uh, I will not talk too much about here, but we have this uh, initial non-convex, this is for the drag minimization, this initial non-convex shape with a lot of corners. So uh, you start writing the algorithm, and the algorithm is able to uh, refine where it sees corners, but eventually these corners are smoothed out by the minimization flow. And in here you see that it's uh, refined almost uh, in the same scale all around here, meaning that some corners were coarse. And now a genuine corner appears, because we know that the um, minimizer for the drag in a Stokes flow will have a sharp point uh, in here, and it will be quite symmetric. And so you see as we get farther and farther with a real corner, the corner gets more refined. No, it's Stokes. Yeah. Uh, the, the it's not really symmetric because we have a Dirichlet uh, inflow and a traction-free outflow. But it, it looks quite symmetric. Uh, th this is just a zoom of uh, the previous simulation to track the corner a little better. But the selection of color is, again, not good. So I'll just skip. It's, it's the same as before while zooming out in the corners. OK, and this was just a bypass. And so now I will do something that uh, general generally you don't have to do in a presentation, which is to use, uh, uh, so this is the last slide, and then I will use another PDF for technical reasons, but it's a continuation of, of the talk. So something I, I wanted to mention here is um, when you are at the discrete level and you are doing all these computations, you need some tools that are more or less crucial depending on your geometry. And these tools uh, well, involves doing mesh adaptivity. And mesh adaptivity on the surface is not a trivial thing if you're doing geometric problems. If you do the, na the, the naive refinement, let's say, more likely your code will not work. So you have to be careful. And uh, we, we wrote a paper about this, and we call it geometric consistency. And I'm not talking about that today either. Then also, when you are um, moving your mesh, sometimes uh, the, the quality of your me mesh gets bad. So you need to account for this. And a, a way to account for this is by um, 
rearranging the nodes and when you say rearranging the nodes in a surface you also have to be uh, a little careful because the surface it's a, a triangulation but there are ways uh, to deal with this and also time step adaptivity one way to control the time step from the geometry is that you don't want the time step to be as big as to cross nodes and destroy your mesh okay so having said that I will do what you usually don't have to do just to change to another PDF to continue the talk and uh, well same thing I should say that this part of the world was partially supported by uh, a grant from KAUST and so um, it may look a little different but uh, it's an application of the, the, the previous final element and scheme. Now, now I'm talking about surface restoration. Uh, so by surface restoration, I understand the process of replacing uh, a damaged or incomplete region of a surface that restores the original surface in uh, a suitable way. So the settings are you have a nice smooth surface, mother surface M, and then for some reason a piece of that surface is removed or damaged that would be the rest red piece gamma taken away and that leaves the boundary of gamma which is that curve in there so uh, some notation let's call the normal to the surface nu and this should be all notation now it's at the mean curvature the vector mean curvature so the goal is only knowing information what is the boundary of the patch that we want to restore and what is the normal vector at that boundary we would like to find some suitable filling for that hole so two possible fillings are just put a disk there that is uh, very smooth but definitely doesn't help with the normal in this case if I put a piece of a sphere it's not only smooth but it has a good normal compared to that so in principle surface restoration we can say that it pays nicely and it looks appealing to the eyes um, so what are the uh, existing models for these well I, I would say that, that the standard way to tackle this type of problem is through what is called a geometric partial differential equation method where the goal is to define a time dependent flow converging to the surface that you want uh, to, to, to the nicely um, pasted surface and some example of used flows in um, surface modeling for which uh, surface restoration is one special case are mean curvature flow, surface diffusion and Wilmer flow so this first one here is a second order flow, the one that we talked before and surface diffusion and Wilmer flow are fourth order flow so if you use a second order flow there is no hope to impose continuity on of the normal you can only impose the boundary condition and if you use a fourth order flow think of the bilaplastian if you want you can impose then some uh, boundary value and some boundary slope. The problem with the fourth order flow is that it's much more expensive to solve than a second order flow. So the, the method that uh, I, I propose is based on a geometric differential identity. It generates an iterative scheme. There is no timing in the method. And in each iteration, I solve only a second order elliptic problem on the surface but even though being second order it allows to impose not only boundary values but also boundary slopes and even preference of curvatures on the interior so what is the motivation for this? so the motivation is this whole equation that I have used several times so far so it's a geometric identity and also uh, this is true, this is the divergence of the normal so this is like a uh, the, the, this, is, this is k in here so those are geometric identities and now I start adding elements to these geometric identities that at the smooth level are completely harmless they are zero let's say at the smooth level so I will add some extension of the boundary normal and some regions of preferred curvature but at the discrete levels this will be crucial to implement the algorithm so extension of the boundary normal let's consider a capital N that is just a restriction of the normal of the surface. At smooth level we have everything available. 
so I'm just renaming the normal but also I'm selecting certain pieces of uh, the surface where this normal will act. In principle I want this to be active only close to the boundary. And also for the curvature, a restriction of the real curvature, and now this WK is selecting some interior regions where I want the curvature to be like that. But at the smooth level I do nothing, just redefining things with different names. Yes, well in the, this case gamma is the yeah, it, it's the exact patch that was removed. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not I do nothing, just defining stuff here. Uh, so using this definition, I can rewrite these two equations in this form here. So um, basically I'm just doing linear combinations of one and one minus that quantity. So in here it's, uh, it's this is uh, h because k, k times nu is h. So wk h plus one minus wk and this is h again by using this other equation here. And the normal nu now is split in two pieces. So this is nu again. If you add these two, you get nu. So there are two splits. A split of the normal and a split of the curvature. And this is exactly, exactly the same as uh, the first line. I just add new names into there. And now you integrate this by parts. And you get this expression here. This expression here is a, an identity of the smooth level and is completely equivalent to this, just renaming things. But now this that you see here, can be interpreted in the discrete setting to give the algorithm. So this is the germ of the algorithm that I'm going to talk about. So first, in the discrete counterpart, um, some notation. Gamma zero will be the initial approximation to gamma, and it will be a triangulation. We're in the discrete setting. So let's say we look for this piece of the sphere, and we start with the disk, because this disk is easy to generate. And this is just a notation for the boundary on gamma zero that should share the original boundary, and that's something that we have access to. And uh, even though this is continuous and this is discrete, we can interpret this equality as saying the nodes of the boundary of gamma zero lie on the continuous boundary of gamma. Uh, and gamma m will be the triangulated approximation to gamma given at iteration n of the algorithm. And this is a finite element space defined on, on the triangulated surface. So now it's where n and k take real meaning. It's at the discrete level. This n and k before were just restriction of the normal and the curvature, but now we don't have gamma anymore. So now these two things will be defined in the embedding space. Before we were defined on the surface, and now they are defined everywhere. But uh, so we think that n is an extension of the normal that we know on the boundary, and k is just some preferred total curvature that somehow we can guess. This is an optional; we can put it or not. And wn and wk are these weights that say where and how strong um, these two functions n and k will act. So uh, one more ingredient, and it's uh, a definition of a continuous grid normal. The grid doesn't have a continuous normal. It has only a piecewise discontinuous normal in each element. So one way to generate a, a continuous normal is kind of like through, um, let's say, a, a gradient recovery. So basically, I, I do some averaging. This phi should be a density function, and I want it to be unit. But uh, this, this is a, a grid continuous normal that you can define. But what we want is also to include the, um, the effect of the data normal that we have for the problem. So we weigh the geometric degree normal with uh, the data normal that we provide. And this will be the scheme continuous normal. What we will need in the scheme is some curvature. And the way to compute the scheme curvature is through the trace of this continuous, the trace of the gradient of that continuous normal. If we have a continuous normal, we can take the gradient. We can take the trace. And this is defined in each element. OK, a lot of definition, I, I agree. Um, so let, let, let me tell you the scheme. You have an initial triangulated surface gamma zero and a maximum number of iterations. So then what you look for is for each iteration, you look for the position that is in the um, finite element space and the updated mesh that can be generated with this position here, such that the position satisfies this elliptic equation. 
So what is on the right hand side is data that you can compute. You don't have to solve anything. So this is just the right hand side and you're solving an elliptic problem to find the new position. And this new position will tell you how to get your gamma n plus one. And that's the scheme. So this is in the case that you don't want any preferred curvature. If you want preferred curvature, this is how the scheme looks like. So again, you're solving an elliptic problem. We don't change what we're solving for. We're just changing the right hand side here. We added one more term. And this is a, well, this is just a technical details that for uh, constructing gamma n plus one, what we do is we actually take the normal component because if we do this, we can also take care of the tangential components through some uh, node rearrangement routine if that becomes necessary. So um, two things. Um, I had to tell you in the practical case, this is the last slide with text. The next are all pictures until the end. So bear with me one, one more slide. So I didn't tell you how in a discrete setting we would compute the extension uh, n or what, how, how to take that average. So the one way to compute the extension of n is if your boundary is smooth, and as I said before, the, the distance function is well defined. So through the distance function, you can do some uh, constant extension of the normal. Let's say you are in a point around some neighborhood of uh, the curve. And for this point, there will be only one point in the curve that realizes the minimal distance. So you define the normal in this point in the neighborhood to be the same as the normal in the point on the curve. And that's something that, that you can do. And for phi x, I will take a phi such that uh, the average becomes an average on a star. So I have a node. I collect all the elements that share this node, which is the star of the node. And then I take the average of the piecewise constant normal on this star and that assigned to the node. And then you extend this to function in the final element space in a unique way. Uh, so this is the, the, the cutoff functions, the cutoff weight function that I use. Uh, it's explicitly what I use, but some other weights can also be used. And, oh, sorry, I, I, I lied before. There was one more slide before the pictures. How to implement the curvature sources. Something that I for, for, forgot to say. So for, for the curvature sources, they are materialized as infinite cylinders. So I say, in this cylinder, this region of space, I want the curvature to be two. In this other cylinder here, I want it to be negative one. The, the, this is optional. You could do it. So let me show you now the simulations, okay. First row is a surface restoration without any curvature source. So it's, this is a truncated cone. I start with a circle, and I let the algorithm evolve, and it restores this guy here. No curvature here, just the simplest one. Yes, so I only specify an extension of the normal in the way that I said before. So in the, uh, in the torus around this circular disk is constant, and I am using a weight that is so like 1 over t over epsilon, 1 minus t over epsilon. This one is uh, the, the same normal, but now I impose some curvature source in the middle. So there is a, a cylindrical curvature source going through there with, let's say, negative 2. I think it's more like negative 3, and some radius uh, 0.3. And this is what you get. The same algorithm with one curvature source. Hmm? Yeah, so it's uh, coming in. There is some indentation in the middle. And now, um, this is how it looks if I, for the same simulation with another angle of view, I put three curvature source, one that is positive and two that are negative, and th but this one are, are smaller in radius. Um, now, uh, another one that you can use surface restoration, this is more uh, likely cause called surface blending, so we, I have two surfaces, and I want to blend the two using some a smooth surface in between. So I provide the initial surface, and I let the algorithm run, and it ends up giving something like this. So it's like a surface restoration, but with two boundaries, if you want to. And this is, um, well, all, all the simulations before were with some axisymmetric normal, even though some were not axisymmetric because the distribution of the curvature was not the normal, was axisymmetric. In this case, I am using a non-axisymmetric normal. So for there are two pieces of cylinder that I want to restore. So you can say that uh, the normal here points that way, and the normal here points this way. So it's not axisymmetric. And what you get is, you see this uh, continuation 
of the slope and this slope coming that way. So it's not it's not convex or concave. It's like it works for these two. And it also works uh, quite well for Lipschitz boundary. By Lipschitz boundary, I mean suppose that now I, I have something that is not really smooth. I have this corner here, and I run the algorithm, and it actually does it's still a pretty good job giving something uh, interesting to the eyes. And one last one, uh, the last simulation. So now I, I'm trying to connect several square pipes. So there are like six square pipes that I want to connect with smooth surface. But what, what I also did in here is to leave the slope of the pipes to be free. So I'm only imposing this to be uh, the, the boundary condition and for the slope to take whatever slope they want to take. And this is what the algorithm does. So with this, uh, how much time I have? Do you have five minutes? OK, so uh, summary and then I finish. So a summary for the second part, let's say. Uh, so I presented a, a new iterative scheme for surface restoration. The benefit of this scheme would be simplicity. Uh, simplicity and computationally robust and efficient. And the reason for this is in each iteration, I am solving an elliptic second order problem instead of the usual fourth order problem that you would do for this um, restorations and there are th this is very new this uh, started maybe two months ago so there are a lot of things that can be done with this in the future uh, because of the language in which is formulated at the continuous level one can ask a mathematical question or at least ask question in mathematical terms uh, such as uh, under what condition to expect convergence convergence to what in well, which space and which norms um, adaptivity is something that I, I am working on right now, so to do this algorithm using some adaptivity. Uh, parallelization, I think th th this can be easy to do and that would allow to, to tackle more complicated surfaces because all you have to do is assemble right-hand sides. So by now we know very well how to solve elliptic problems, even if they are uh, a surface elliptic problem that becomes um, a problem on the plane with uh, coefficients, usually smooth coefficients. So we know how to use multigrid and how to solve the Laplace equation in parallel. And all this algorithm adds its uh, right hand side, but the right hand side is quite independent. So you can assemble the right hand side in separate pieces and then bring it together. They don't depend on, on, on each other. And well, to use uh, some other approximations, I know higher order elements, piecewise quadratic, uh, so higher order is uh, geometric elements, uh, and etc. So with this, uh, I will stop and thank you for your attention. So I, I don't know about any theoretical result for the completely discrete scheme. I, I don't think they have that even for the mean curvature flow. Uh, for half discrete scheme, so I think if you discretize in space and not in time, there are some results about the stability. Mm, and names for that should be Zyuk, Dekelnik, and maybe Elliot. I'm not sure I can, I can check. Uh, Okay. I think that if you have a fluid, it helps you a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's more difficult than geometric problem alone than geometric plus fluid. No, no, no. That so that's that's the point exactly. So if you wouldn't have this epsilon, or, or if you use only the boundary, then it would depend. So where where you try to close, it would depend on your mesh size, because of the averaging. Okay. But if if you take a constant epsilon, then regardless of your mesh size, you oh, get the same shape, and that's that's the main reason to take 
the epsilon and not something that depends on the mesh size. So it should depend on your geometry, basically on how how far in you can go from the boundary with the distance function. And so that, so the main point there was you're trying to get rid of the four-order problem, which is basically the four-order Right. I don't know. But in, in the, the definition of surface restoration is vague in the sense yeah, that you want something that looks nice to the eyes. And right. the, the fastest you can get this, the better. Right, right. No, I was just wondering no. somehow there was a connection there. There may be. I, I think that, that, that you have more flexibility than here than in the Wilmer flow. In, uh, in the Wilmer flow, you wouldn't be able to put um, curvature sources in, in different places. Because it's, it's a time evolution that will try to minimize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it yeah, that would be interesting to, to see how different they are. <laughs>